Alright guys, today we are going back to the high stakes playing at Hustler Casino. Stakes will be 25, 50, 100 if I'm not mistaken and the game is starting in about an hour. So it's time for me to get going. But that's it for now. Let's get back to Hustler Casino and see how we start off the year 2024 playing on live streams. All right, guys, here we are once more. Today we're playing 25, 50, 100, but it actually turned into 50, 100, 200 pretty quickly. So let's just count this game as a 50, 1, 2 game. Anyway, in the first interesting hand, we are going to have fireworks right away. In this one, there's a bunch of limpers before I look down at Ace Jack in the third blind, aka the straddle. Probably the best hand as it stands, so I decide to raise it. I make it $1,400 to go. I get called by Brown Bala on the button, and then Suited Superman calls once again from the middle blind. So we're going to go three ways to an interesting flop. It's 10-7-3 with two spades. Being multi-way and not even in position, I don't really think this is a good situation to bluff. Also, the fact that the board is 10 high and lower is not ideal. So when Superman checks, I check as well. Brown Bala also checks. So we go three ways still to the turn, which is the five of hearts. Superman checks again, and for the same reasons I check the flop, I decide to check the turn. Although starting to bluff now, I wouldn't necessarily hate, but I think checking is better still. So that's what I do, and Brown Bala checks as well. So not a whole lot of action. I am considering that I have the ace of spades. So we could always improve on the river with an ace or a jack, or potentially try to steal this one if a spade comes. Looks like that might be the case because it's the queen of spades on the river. And now suited Superman leads out for around half pot. He puts in about of 2,500 bucks. Like I said, I have the ace of spades, which means he cannot have the nuts since the nuts on this board would be an ace high flush. And if I did have a flush, I would definitely try to go for some maximum value in the form of all in for the remainder of Superman's chips. I did miscalculate. I thought he had like 20,000. Turns out he has 30,000, but I guess the play still works. Might even be better the fact that he has more chips. Brown Baller gets out of the way and now it's back on Superman, who as you guys can see, actually has a flush. I thought he could easily have a hand like two pair, maybe even a set that slow played all the way down and is now hating life. I did not think he had a flush. So yeah, this is a pretty brutal bluff from me. If I'd known his cards, I probably wouldn't have attempted this, but perhaps it's going to work because Superman does not seem to love the situation. You guys might be wondering how often would I check the nut flush draw three ways. And I think the answer is pretty often, especially if I didn't have a pair like, say, ace king of spades or ace jack of spades. Probably wouldn't be bluffing with those hands either, maybe sometimes, but not too often. So I think it's credible that I might play a flush this way. Superman seems to agree because after about two minutes of thinking, he decides to make a tight fold with his six high flush. Don't really hate his decision. He was getting a terrible price to call. And I also don't really love my all in either. So, yeah. Mixed feelings about this hand, but definitely an interesting one to start the night. In the next hand, I raise it up on the button to 500 with 10-7 off. Maybe a little bit too loose, but considering that it folded all the way to me on the button, probably fine to raise this one. I make it 500 and only Brown Bala calls from the straddle. He's got 9-7 off. We go heads up to a flop of 9-6-3 with a flush draw out there. This is the type of board that I think I should be checking back often, but the times that I do bet probably go for a bigger size. So I bet 1100. Brown Bala thinks for a bit and makes the call with his top pair and we see the Jack of Clubs on the turn card. We still have a straight draw and any pair that he flopped is still gonna be hating life if I continue to apply pressure. So for those reasons, I decide to do just that. Brown Bala checks and this time I fire 1600 bucks right around half pot. 
Brown ball is still. He's got a nine. He's going nowhere just yet. He's a sticky player, so he's in there still. So looking for some help on the river, but it does not come. Instead, it's the king of clubs. I don't have the best hand to bluff with. So when he checks it to me, I think giving up is probably okay. We have removal to hands that we're trying to get to fold, and we don't have any removal to hands that might call, like two pair or backdoor flush, for example. All sorts of holdings that he could have and still call down. But at the same time, you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take or something like that. So I decide to bet two thirds the size of the pot. Would be doing this with hands like ace jack, any king, two pair, straights, you know, lots of stuff on this board that I would be betting for value. So I decided to throw it in there, 4,200 bucks. Brown Bala, after some thought, decides he's had enough and lets go of his measly pair of nines. And we get this one through. This next hand is more of a collector's item than anything instructional, if you will. In this one, we are playing the stand-up game. I'm sure you guys know what that is already. There's a raise from Dan to 1,200 from late position, and then Alec Torelli, who is back from touring the world, I think. Nice to have him back. He decides to go all in for $14,000. Now, I'll be the first to say that is no small chunk of money. It's a lot of US dollars, but in this particular game, it's not a whole lot. We're all pretty deep and the blinds are high enough that 14,000 is essentially a short stack. And you see this from time to time where players recognize that having a short stack in the stand-up game is beneficial because you can just go all in and hope that everyone folds. Well, it seems Alec will get his wish because it gets all the way to me in the straddle and I only have 9-7 offsuit. But what the hell, if he's got two over cards, if he has anything that's not a pair, we're not in terrible shape. And being able to earn our sit down button would be pretty cool with 9-7 offsuit against an all-in. So I make a somewhat embarrassing call mostly for the LOLs and the fun. So I toss in the money. Not only is this bad because my hand is bad, but also Dan is left to act behind me who could easily just go all in after I call the 14,000 and put me in a terrible spot, but that ends up not happening. So let's just disregard that analysis altogether. We are going heads up with Alec Torelli all in pre-flop. We decide to run it just once after a little bit of negotiating and we get lucky. There's a nine on the flop and we hold all the way to the river. Gonna take this one down all skill, all talent. Hit me up for coaching if you want hands like these in your repertoire. Moving right along to this next one where I have ace five of hearts. I raise it up to 500 bucks. Dylan makes it 2,400 in the big blind and now it's back on me. And this is a situation where I think all three options have some merit for different reasons. Dylan is a good buddy of mine, so in the end, I decide to take the friendliest of the three options and just call. We have position and a playable hand, so we're gonna go heads up to a flop of 10-7-5 with one heart out there. We flop bottom pair, which means we are now beating hands that were better ace highs pre-flop, like ace king, ace queen, etc. But of course, are still in trouble if he's got a big pocket pair. So when he continues for 1400, I see no reason to do anything but just call. Turn card is the worst. It's the king of diamonds. So if he was stabbing the flop with like ace king or king queen, we are now behind. And that's assuming he had a hand that, like I said, is not a pocket pair. So when he goes all in now for around a pot sized bet, it's a pretty miserable spot for me. Actually, it's not even miserable. It's a straightforward fold. But for whatever reason, I was getting this vibe that Dylan might be up to something. I don't really know what was going on. I mean, on paper, this seems like an instant fold. So I'm not sure why this took me so long, but in the end I do fold and promptly get shown the nine high bluff from Dylan. A very nice play from him, recognizing that this board is probably better for him and using all that to get me to fold my hand. Good play from him, but we move right along to this next hand where things get a little strange. I guess what else is new when you're watching Hustler Casino Live? In this one, Dan opens up the action to $1,500. I believe in this hand, I was in the $400 straddle on his right. Yep, sure enough, there I am in with 400 in front of me. I look down at Ace-7 offsuit, and against an early position open, this should just be a fold. Maybe defend any Ace against like a button or late position raise, but Dan was the first to act, so him raising is kind of scary. 
but I'm not here to shy away from action, so I make the call. For some reason, I woke up on the gambly side of the bed this morning. We go heads up to a flop of 10 three deuce with two clubs. A little bit better for me than for him, so I was surprised to see him continue betting for this small size. Would opt to check raise with a bunch of hands, but ace high is still good enough to call down, I think. We're still beating all sorts of Broadway bluffs like king queen or jack nine suited or whatever. So I make the call and we see the five of hearts on the turn. Once more, I expect Dan to likely check, but after I check, he fires away. $6,000 in overbet. You can't say this guy doesn't have style. I don't really know how he plays, but like I said on the flop, we are still beating all sorts of stuff that I think Dan is capable of bluffing with. And I don't know, similar to the last hand, I had this vibe that I likely had the best hand. So I make the call once more for $6,000. Looking for a break on the river to hopefully prove my theory correct that we are ahead. And that's exactly what it is. Not only is it a brick, but it's a great card for us to get to showdown. It's the 10 of spades. Considering how I've played my hand so far, I think it's very likely that I could have a 10, or at least Dan might think that. So when I check it, I definitely expect him to check now, unless of course he actually has a 10 himself or some sort of full house. But it seems Dan is not interested in firing another bluff. He checks it back and we win it with ace high. Not a bad result considering that ace seven offsuit is a terrible hand. And with that, we move to the biggest pot of this night where I raise it up from first position to $1,000. It seems the 400 was on again. Jesus, I didn't realize how big this game got. Kind of weird for a Wednesday. But anyway, Dan on my direct left bumps it up to 2,800. Back to me and against a small re-raise like that, I think you should definitely not fold with a hand as playable as queen jack suited. Occasionally mixing in another raise is probably fine but Dan doesn't have the biggest stack and we're not super deep that getting all fancy with queen jack suited is a good idea in my opinion so I just call and we go heads up to a flop of 763 with two hearts I check it and now he continues for a bet of 2500 again a little unexpected for him to bet on this board at least that's what I was thinking and like I said on the previous hand I would be check raising a lot of hands on this kind of board against a small size and this time we do have one of those good candidates. We have queen high, which is not good showdown value, but we have a flush draw and we could also use this board to represent all sorts of stuff since I could easily have pocket sevens, pocket sixes, maybe even pocket threes sometimes. Could have flopped a straight with five, four suited. Um, yeah, you guys get the idea. So I raise it up to 8,500 bucks. Dan has a straight draw and two over cards. So he makes the call. And we get the dream turn card, although of course I don't know it in the moment. It's the nine of hearts, giving me the flush and giving Dan a straight. I am happy to continue betting since I've got a flush. I think a small bet makes the most sense here. Would also be doing this with bluffs to try to set up an all in on the river. So I make it 8,000. And Dan, of course, with a straight can't go anywhere just yet. He makes the call and we see kind of a bad river. It's the nine of diamonds. I don't think I'm beat necessarily, but the reason I don't like this card is if he does have an over pair, it's going to get really tough to get value because now even hands like 10, nine suited or eight, nine suited are capable of beating over pairs. And that's assuming that he was ahead if that is what he has. That said, I still think we only have one choice, which is to go all in. He's got less than a pot sized bet remaining. And if I did have a bluff, like say H3 of clubs or six five of clubs these sorts of holdings i would for sure be going all in as well so that's what i do and we don't get snap called which looks like good news even better news is that he doesn't snap fold either but sadly in the end dan makes a great fold with his 10 high straight and we don't win the absolute maximum credit to him nice pot at least we get to win it and the next one i raise it up with ace deuce of diamonds and get called by two players in the blinds so we go three ways to a flop of king eight five no diamonds at all. Nothing really going for me, so when it checks to me, I check it back. And we see the three of hearts on the turn. Stan checks again, but now Brown Ball of fires out for a thousand bucks. I find this to be odd. I think mostly if he had a pair, like a king or an eight or a five or a three, those are pairs, right? If he had one of those, he'd probably check again because he knows that I might be checking back the flop with something good. So this bet, I think, represents either a very good hand, like two pair or better, or just a bluff like any sort of draw. Well, we're beating the ladder, so I make the call with ace high. And what do you know, we improve to the ace of clubs on the river. That means we've now got top pair. If he was betting a king, we now beat him. But like I said on the turn, I don't think he's got a king. I think he's either got two pair or some sort of bluff. 
He now fires out for $6,000, which is a very big bet. If he had bet small, I would have snap called or maybe even raised once in a blue moon. But against this sizing, I think our options are to fold or to call. And, well, I thought he was likely bluffing on the turn, so this ace shouldn't really change much. I mean, four deuce suited does get there, but we have a two, and even without that, how often do people really play those hands? So, yeah, as you guys can see, I'm beat, but I just didn't believe him, so I ended up making the call, and I was wrong. We lose a pot with top pair versus two pair. Not too surprising. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the last interesting hand of this particular night, where I finally get a premium Pocket Kings on the button. I raise it up to 500 and face a re-raise from Stan in the third blind. He makes it 2,500. Now, I would say like 99% of the time, when you raise on the button with Kings and someone re-raises you from the blinds, you should probably just keep raising. It's not rocket science. This time, for some reason, like I've been saying the whole vlog, spider senses were kind of kicking in and I caught a weird feeling. Maybe it was the fact that Stan had played fairly snug most of the night. And then I also thought to myself, if he is bluffing, we probably make some more money by just trapping. So that's what I do. I make the call and we go heads up to a flop of 974. Another thing I should mention is I usually like to slow play pre-flop more when there's not like super deep stacks. He's got 40k, which considering how big the blinds are, is not a whole lot. I mean, it's still a good amount, but it's not like crazy deep. So I just call and yeah, like I said, we go to a flop, 974 with two spades. Stan checks this board, which I think is fine. And uh, I don't check. I've got an overpair, so I make it 1700. And now Stan makes the call. Turn cards the deuce of clubs shouldn't really change much. Stan checks again, and now it's on me. I think checking back at this point is actually okay, but instead I decide to bet $2,000. Stan thinks for a bit and check raises now to 7,500, which is an interesting play, I should say. In fact, it's kind of perfect against my exact hand. So yeah, credit to Stan. Nice raise. I, of course, make the call since we very likely still have the best hand. Still beating queens and jacks and tens and ace nine suited and any possible bluff. So of course, I'm still in there. And we go to a river, which is the six of diamonds. Stan now checks it. And I think he's played his hand in a way that indicates most likely a one pair holding at least that was my analysis in the moment and we beat almost every single one pair holding except pocket aces so i think going for some value has some merit it might be a little bit too thin since we're probably not getting called by queens or jacks on a board like this so checking back even though my hand is pretty damn good i think would be rational but i do decide to go for some value i don't want to go too big though i just throw in 5k around a quarter of the size of the pot and we get snap called probably not good news when we get called that quickly and sure enough he's got the aces so on one hand it sucks to finally get a nice hand like kings and be up against aces but silver lining is that pot could have been way bigger and uh yeah more disastrous i should say but yeah, as mentioned, that was the last fun hand of tonight's evening. And like always, I hope you all enjoyed. All right, so just finished the session here at Hustler. As per usual, I am the last one remaining well, not always, but many times it so happens to be that I am the last one that still wants to play. Uh, unfortunately, it did not go super well today. I think on stream I lost like 5k, and then after the stream, despite playing a bunch of hours, like an additional three hours, I lost like another five, maybe a little less. I haven't done the exact math yet, but I think it looks like I lost around eight or 9,000, give or take, which of course is a pretty terrible result when you spend all day playing cards and then lose nearly you know a 2005 honda civic not the best feeling but that's life that's poker that's gambling but yeah that's all i got for you guys today thanks for watching thanks for all the support until next time good luck at your local tables peace <laughs>